Well, Labor's climate scare campaign continues a month after they released the National Climate Risk Assessment. Have a look. The National Climate Risk Assessment highlighted that Australia will experience climate hazards like floods, cyclones, heat waves, droughts and bushfires more frequently, more severely and often at the same time. Yeah, that was in Parliament today. I showed you last month when it first came out that this report exaggerated the risks of global warming and ignored any benefits. It was typical alarmist stuff, preaching economic and environmental doom and downplaying the costs of going to net zero, even though, as I said earlier, we all know getting Australia to net zero won't make any difference to whether the world gets hotter or not. Anyway, one expert who cast his eye over the report was Roger Pilkey Jr., a senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute, and I, I crossed to him in Finland and asked about the main flaws in the report. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for having me. The, the, the first thing to understand is climate change is real, it's serious, and so risk assessments are necessary. And it's important to get risk assessments right. Uh, and for me, the, the thing that stood out for me right away was the, the basic input scenarios that were used uh, to inform the report. Scenarios are what shape uh, how the climate impacts come out of the climate models. Um, in, in a risk assessment, it's okay to use a high emission scenario. High emissions means a lot of climate change. Uh, but the high emission scenario has to be plausible. Um, and plausible means that it could happen in the real world. And the first thing I noticed was that uh, this report on the high end uses a scenario that's implausible based on our research. Uh, it's a scenario called SSP 3-7.0. That, that detail is not important. What is important is that it projects more than 12.5 billion people in 2100. No one believes that. Uh, we'll probably be closer to half that in 2100 if uh, demographers are correct about the collapse of population. And another big assumption was uh, a return to coal energy, that the entire world will, will be transitioning to coal, such that coal makes up more than 50% of global energy uh, consumption in 2100. That leads to massive, massive emissions. Yeah, and it's just not going to happen, as you say. It's not, it's not a, a real-world analysis. Uh, tell us also about the estimates in terms of insurance costs that are used in this report that you've focused on yourself. Yeah, so one, one of the things that I found was interesting, and I've done a lot of work on disasters and, and projecting future disasters, including in, in Australia, um, and what people should understand is that the biggest driver of the costs of disaster, I'm not talking about weather, I'm talking about the costs of disaster, are more people, more property, and more wealth in locations exposed to extreme events like bushfires and cyclones. Um, and I, I noted, uh, I was just in Australia recently, that uh, when the report came out, the, the headlines said, you know, $40 billion by 2050 due to climate change. And if you actually go into the report and track that number down, um, it's referenced to the 2024 Colvin report. And if you look that up and you go to the $40 billion, you see it says, this does not include any of the effects of climate change. So this is one of those games of uh, telephone or Chinese whispers where, where a number takes on a life of itself and shows up on headlines across the country, and it's not based on the actual science. And there are also graphs that show the normalised cost of insurance from disasters in Australia. What does that tell us? So normalised costs, so, so because disaster costs increase as there's more people, there's more property, uh, we, we adapt after Cyclone Tracy came through in 1974. There were uh, improved building standards applied. So you can't just look at the rising costs to understand what's going on. You have to adjust them. And that, that's a process called normalization. Uh, and we helped introduce that into the literature a long time ago, uh, more than 25 years ago. And uh, a group in Australia called Risk Frontiers uh, for uh, Australian uh, in Insurance Group adjusts historical losses for societal change. And once you do that, there's no trend uh, overall. It doesn't mean climate change isn't real or it's not serious. It just means we can't see it in that time series of lost data. Yeah, now, as you say, you've got to take this stuff seriously. You've got to look at uh, climate trends and you've got to have rational risk assessments. And what struck me about this report was it looked at all the downside from a warming globe, at warming temperatures, but there are no benefits. So we just know that's not true. Not true. For instance, if there are to be more deaths from heat, we know they're going to be more than made up for from fewer deaths from severe cold, which kills more people even in Australia, let alone around the rest 
rest of the world. You've got to be upfront and honest about this stuff, don't you, rather than just try and scare people with only the bad news. Yeah, so this is what's really important about, about government climate assessments. And I, I've often said, I say that this in the US, if, if, if uh, climate assessments didn't exist, we'd have to invent them because there's so much literature, there's so much contradictory claims. And, and for climate assessments to be taken seriously, they have to play things straight. Um, and, and even beyond uh, not referencing the full picture of, of good news and bad news, um, one of the things I found you know, remarkable was that the Australian government released a parallel report on uh, the technologies and costs associated with being on track to get net zero. And in contrast to the risk assessment, uh, the, the cost report used a very aggressive, uh, optimistic scenario for emissions, yeah. where in fact they, they will peak and go down. And that made the costs look much lower than they would had they used the exact same scenario they used in the risk assessment. And for me, that was uh, just a bit too clever. And it, it's the sort of thing that, that degrades public trust, or at least risks degrading public trust in government science assessments. Yeah, it's so spot on and so typical. They exaggerate the costs of uh, climate change and climate change adaption, and uh, and they minimise the costs of their own renewable energy strategy. It's a, it is so common, and, and you've uh, crashed through it. Uh, really appreciate your insight, Roger. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Justin.